I'm Crystal Farik, um, and I've just uh, recently entered as the director of the Asian Pacific American Institute at NYU, and it's my distinct privilege and pleasure to begin our academic year of programming tonight with the launch of our 2018-2019 artist in residence, Danushka Yakuputiyagi. <laughs> Now, um, Sitani is a Sri Lankan-born, Thailand-raised, uh, Brooklyn-based, multidisciplinary artist, cultural producer, activist, and DJ who performs under the name Ushka. Um, her professional, political, and artistic interests focus on migration and immigration, and she uses writing, video, music, and audio to explore the everyday lives of brown and black communities from the global south to the west. Um, Thanu has worked as a storyteller and organizer in the immigrant rights movement for a decade um, and now conducts uh, intersectional work in climate justice. As a DJ, she's known for her um, genre blending styles um, across electronic club and bass music that deliberately traverses borders, creating soundscapes that reflect the immigrant experience in global migrant uh, cities. Since 2013, Ushka has thrown a QT POC um, and immigrant right centered uh, global club called iBamba. She has um, performed at venues including the Brooklyn Museum, MoMA PS1, American Museum of Natural History, Rubin Museum of Art, Queens Museum, and Harbor Front Center Toronto. She uses DJing and cultural organizing as a means of crafting intentional spaces and fostering community building. She works and performs with a wide community of DJs and producers, some of whom you'll meet tonight, um, with the philosophy that artistic and cultural production at its best is a collaborative process. She holds degrees from Hampshire College and University of Massachusetts Amherst, and you can find her work at thenushka.com and on social media at ty um, underscore ushka. And we're also incredibly lucky to have several, uh, several DJs here tonight, um, beginning with um, um, Jace Clayton, um, who'll be joining um, Thanu on stage. An uh, Jace Clayton is an artist and writer based in Manhattan, also known for his, DJ, his work as DJ Rupture. Um, Clayton uses an interdisciplinary approach to focus on how sound, memory, and public space interact with an emphasis on low-income communities and the Global South. His book, Uproot, Travels in the 21st Century Music and Digital Culture, was published in 2016 by Fire Str uh, Strauss and Giroux. So we at the um, APA Institute decided to focus our programming efforts this year on the theme of migration, refugees, and the politics of sanctuary. And we are delighted to have an artist whose work so beautifully resonates with these concerns. For Asian American and other diasporic communities, grassroots visionaries have been as essential to the making of culture as they have been for political organizing. While many observers have described our current moment as one of resurgent and mostly conservative populism around the globe, we ought to keep in mind that popular movements have also struggled to against racism and xenophobia, seeking dignity for immigrants, people of color, queer folks, and many others in the United States and across the world. In her work, and as a DJ and as an activist, Thanu brings sound, music, lyrics, and movement to bear on struggles for immigrant rights, climate justice, and a host of other progressive causes that are of urgent concern for the APA Institute as well. So we're beyond thrilled to, have, to be able to host her this year. I just have a few sort of housekeeping notes before we begin. Um, you should have received a note card from the staff um, earlier, uh, in, uh, the few minutes ago, and we encourage you to use these cards for um, questions you might want to have addressed during the Q&A. The staff will be coming through periodically to collect them from the audience. Um, today, you may or may not know, is, the, is National Voter Registration Day, um, and we have also have a table for voter registration set up here to my left. Um, if you're eligible to vote and are not yet registered to, we encourage you to take a second do, to do so tonight. Um, and following tonight's um, program, we invite you to attend the reception, which will feature the sounds of D, uh, DJ Ice Cold, um, who will uh, be introduced uh, more at length in a little while. Um, and last but certainly not least, I want to thank the staff of the APA Institute, um, and especially our Director of, of Pro Public Programs and Communications, Amita Mangani, for all her and their work in organizing this event. So now, without further delay, please join me in welcoming, welcoming Danushka Yakuputiyagi and Jace Clayton, AKA DJ Ushka and DJ Rapture. I don't think anyone said my full name in a long time. <laughs> it's, it's great. Um, I'm, I just want to say, too, I'm so excited for this artist residency and to see um, what's going to, going to emerge from it. You know, I've, I've known you and your work for a while. Um, and I think a way to open up this conversation would be to kind of rewind back to your, the beginning of you in America um, and how your experience as a young student here and immigrant led to you um, both developing your DJ practice and also getting into immigration activism. 
Yeah, um, first of all, thank you to the APA Institute. I really appreciate this honor. It's um, been wild. Um, yeah, so I came to the US in 2003 uh, from Thailand. I grew up in Bangkok, Thailand, but I'm Sri Lankan um, to attend Hampshire College. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I think that the first four years of my like sort of experience in the US, I wasn't really thinking about immigration or like immigrant rights because I didn't like I was still learning the landscape but it was very much after I graduated college it was like 2008 the financial system had crashed and it was really difficult to get a job and so some of my first um, roles or jobs I was like working at a Sri Lankan restaurant like under the table with like you know um, and I was uh, also the a researcher for a book by Rinku Sen um, called The Accidental American, which was about the undocumented immigrants who um, worked in the Twin Towers um, and did not, when, when the towers fell, like their families did not get any sort of support. Um, and so that sort of experience and um, just working on like migration issues like through both like working in, in a kitchen but also like engaging in this research like led me eventually to, be, to do more like immigrant rights based research. Um, and you know, at the same time, it was always like a hustle for like getting a, getting a visa, staying on a visa. Like I was on a student visa and then I was on, on an OPT, which is like a one year thing. And then I had to get back on a student visa. And then I was like, I had an H1B. Um, so I mean, just like, so I think like a lot of my 20s were spent just like trying to navigate like how to stay. Um, and it was really, it was really difficult and it was really traumatic and also like, such a privilege also to ha even have a visa. Um, but so basically when I graduated um, my master's, I ended up working at the New York Immigration Coalition for seven years, um, partially because I couldn't, um, I couldn't shift because of um, being tied to an employer. Um, but I think for me, like entering, entering sort of da dance spaces and sort of DJ culture was actually like the most liberatory thing that I could do because I, when I moved back to New York, it felt like I had like spent so much time fighting to stay here that I, I just got really depressed. And so for me, what music actually allowed me to do was to like craft a space for myself. And so nightlife spaces, you know, and nightlife spaces can be really violent, they can be really misogynistic, but um, they can also be liberatory and they can also be a place where you, um, you know, meet people that you organize with. And so I started um, DJing, publicly maybe in like 2011. I think that's around the time I, I met you. Um, and I just wanted to, to help like really craft um, spaces that were safe for immigrants, for folks of color, for queer folks. Um, because I do, I do believe that actually like nightlife spaces do provide some sort of a, a liberat liberatory like safe space for people at certain times. And it was just a way for me to like grow community and also talk about things like immigration in a different way. I think because I was, I'm very much also in, in policy work, like I did work around immigrant rights, I do work around climate, like I spend a lot of time like talking about like the violences of, you know, attributed on black and brown bodies by the state. For me, cultural spaces um, was a way to actually like shift a conversation and to actually create imaginative spaces where we were actually creating the things that we were talking about because ultimately for me I think like you know I mean you the revolution if the revolution's not like fun <laughs> what's the point yeah yeah I would love to hear a, a little bit about what crafting those spaces looked like so there's a question about what how you think about DJing as a form or how you think about you know, like, what are the secrets to, to Ibomba, to, to throwing a good, inclusive party that, that creates the space that you want to see visualized? Yeah, um, <clears throat> um, sorry, what was the first part of your question? Oh, <laughs> DJing is form. Okay. You know, what's, uh, yeah. what's the Ushka style? Yeah, so I think my style is, um, I'm interested in lots of different kinds of music, and I, I think that the way in which my um, the way I DJ is described is sort of as, as, as genre blending and I um, cut through like music from different, electronic music from different parts of the world. So it could be like club music, I mean particularly black club music or you know cumbia or champeta from like Colombia to like soca, chutney from Trini Trinidad to 
um, Afrobeats or uh, other South Asian music, but I do that very deliberately uh, because I think that that's sort of like a, um, a cross-border experience in and of itself in terms of um, genre blending. And also there's a lot of um, migrant connections between music. So for example, like with soca music, which I really love um, from Trinidad, um, if you actually listen to soca chutney, it's actually like a mishmash of like South Asian um, drums and um, West African sounds, and it's because of forced migration from both of those places to Trinidad. Um, so that's an example. And if, even if you look at like Champeta from Colombia, it's like also there's a lot of West African influences. Um, and so for me, in a lot of my first um, mixtapes, like it was very de deliberate. It was actually a way of putting um, into art something that um, I was sort of doing in, our, in my organizing. And, um, Ibomba, you know, Ibomba is a very small party. I think there's people in the room who throw like m much better parties and like huge, much larger parties. And that's like a whole conversation with like lots of different people around like how they um, do that. Um, but I think for me, again, like nightlife is complicated. It's um, venues are complicated and it's really difficult to say that any type of venue or place can be safe. Um, particularly for queer folks, for trans folks, for folks of color. But I think that um, you, can, you can try. And so for, for me, I think I, Ibomba stayed intentionally small and it very much was always fam. It was like people who had connected on dance floors or were part of larger music communities who knew that they could come to a place and um, you know, connect with each other. And we, like three years ago, we actually moved to this uh, venue in Bedstuy that's a uh, queer Puerto Rican owned. Before that, we were at this venue that was really misogynistic. And it was difficult, you know, because like a lot of queer folks would come, but there was also, it wasn't like necessarily like a space that was safe for like queer people or like other folks of color. And so I think, you know, nightlife is always shifting and like um, club spaces are always shifting and they're not for everyone. And so I think that's like in constant flux how to create a space, um, you know, that works for people. And you know, Ibomba is not a monthly party anymore. We don't do it uh, as much. But I think that where, what I'm interested in still is sort of just like DJing as a form that can sort of bring people together. Like what, some of my favorite moments when DJing is when like, you know, I'll like have played, like the other day, I like DJed something on Saturday and I played like a, a Zouk song from Haiti and this like person appeared out of nowhere and was like, oh, my grandmother used to play that. And I was like, you know, like those are the moments that I think are really beautiful because I think that the thing about like genre blending is that it helps people to, to listen to things that they've already heard in like a different way. It's a way of storytelling. Yes, it just reminds me, I was playing in, Paris, a kind of like a swish club, and I played Zouk, a Kassav track, and then security guards start dancing, you know, and so yeah. that's this moment where the borders between the workers and the, there's all these class differences start to melt. When the security then, guards start dancing, yes, you've won. Like. Things, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I just uh, quickly to point out, I think it's also very interesting what you said about the, the value in oftentimes staying small. Um, because there can be an impulse, especially in nightlife, whatever. It's got to be huge. And, and so many times what makes an event, a moment, uh, a movement special is actually the smallness of the voice uh, and, and that. But um, switching, switching lanes a bit, I would actually love to hear a, your move from immigrant activism to focusing on climate change in part of your daily activist and organizing work. Yeah, um, so I, um, I work for an organization called 350.org now. I used to work at the New York Immigration Coalition. Um, I left um, the New York Immigration Coalition in like March of 2018. I was really, really involved in like the work around the Muslim ban. I was one of the organizers who helped to like get people to JFK. Um, but I also, you know, I, I'd been doing that work at that point for like eight years and um, you know, I mean, I mean, I think, I, I think that it was just really time for change for me. I felt burnt out, but also like I think the trauma of like you know dealing with one's own immigration status and also recognizing like one's privileges and also like working to support other people like it just felt like too personal and like you know I think 
the Trump administration came around and everyone suddenly was like, oh my God, we have to help immigrant communities. And, we're all, and those of us who've been doing this work were like, you do know that Obama deported three million people, right? You do know that like, you know, Clinton was the one who like started the like, you know, criminalization of immigrants, that Bush did the Patriot Act. Like there's a whole trajectory of like, you know, the ways in which like the state has like constantly acted to um, keep black and brown people out, and it didn't start in November 2016. It was way before that. Um, and so even though I definitely had my own fears of like, like I definitely had my moments of like, oh my gosh, am I like abandoning the immigrant rights movement? I don't, I don't feel that way anymore, and I very much like sort of identify as like an immigrant rights organizer who's doing work in climate justice, and, and the work is the same. The work is very much connected. Like, when it comes to the climate crisis, the people who are the most impacted are people from the global south, they're black and brown people, and because of um, the climate crisis very much um, instigated by like the global north, by you know, corporations, like the, the fossil fuel industry that has helped, like basically like, you know, knew that global warming was something that would happen um, through emissions, um, the people who are suffering are the ones who've had the least to do with the problem. So now you have, for example, like the Pacific Islands, um, places like Fiji or the Marshall Islands or Tokelau, like that are literally like 10 feet above sea level. Like they're seeing the impacts right now of sea level rise and people are migrating. Actually, there was in, like, um, I think someone from Fiji applied for climate refugee status in New Zealand fairly recently. Um, even, if, you know, even with Central America, when we're talking about like, you know, families, um, you know, like the detention of families at the border, like partly one of the reasons why people are migrating is because of a drought crisis. And like, it's like, it's like a complicated set of factors like economics, like violence and climate. And you could arguably say the same for Syria. And um, so it's interesting that while, you know, something like the climate crisis is happening, it's like places like the United States or Germany or the UK are like closing their borders based on crises that they've created. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess I'd like to bring up a recent project that we collaborated on. And this was um, at the behest of artist Mel Chin, um, whose spirit I think is also in the room. Very interesting, conceptual, incredibly socially engaged artist um, who had a recent show at the Queens Museum. And so he asked me to help him sort of curate and put together a bunch of pieces of sound art, reaching out to local musicians and DJs. And his prompt was, you know, can you ask these DJs and beat makers to think about the sounds of New York City, to think about literally the subway and what is that like to inhabit that, that space, move through it, and what you hear and experience um, as, a way, as a sort of connective layer of the city. Um, and you and Atropolis turned in a beautiful piece as part of this, which was up running until very recently at the show. But maybe we could hear a minute or so of, of the DJ Ushka and Atropolis track and then talk a little bit about your process behind it. Yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are the way. 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 We are the way
one of the things that a good DJ or beat maker can do is bring together sort of disparate sounds um, in a way that doesn't reduce the individuality or complexity of any of the constituent parts. Um, and I think what we just heard is a really wonderful example of that, um, all the movements we hear. But I'd love to hear a little bit about the sort of behind the scenes to that. Yeah, um, so I've been learning production um, for the last year, um, learning Ableton. Um, and uh, this was basically Atropolis, who I collaborated with, like he's an incredible musician, y'all should all look him up. And it, it was basically the classes we were like doing together, like he was teaching me, and also like we were collaborating on this track. And so when we were invited, when I was invited to do, um, to contribute a piece to Melchin and your project, um, I thought it was like a perfect way to sort of like just collaborate with him and like use sort of the skills that I was learning. But I think what was really exciting to me about this project is that in a lot of my like mixes too, I, I, I like to use like, like I like to drop like little interviews or like, you know, just archival sounds of people talking and this actually required, the, the task was basically to make a track about like the commute, like the subway commute. and. So we recorded some things, we like, you know, also found like sounds online, but for us, I think we wanted to create a track that talked about like how shitty riding the subway sometimes is, <laughs> like it's always delayed. That's why it's called FTA Hustle, but also the ways in which like, you know, just like everyone's constantly like collectively frustrated on, on the sub subway, but there's also these like moments of like joy. So like the, the part you hear where like people are sort of like, hey, hey, and like clapping and dancing, like, that's like, you know, if you go to like 14th Street, you'll, like, you'll hear like drummers and sometimes people will be dancing. Um, and so we wanted to incorporate like the pieces of just like, just like the, using the subway as like a, as a marker of like the complexity of like New York City as like a migrant metropolis where different kinds of people are interacting um, with this like mechanical thing. Yes, and one of the things I'm looking forward to this year is, you know, I've known you primarily as a sort of musician and of course organizer, but I feel like this opportunity we have before us, it's um, in a way it combines and inverts with natural light all these various threads of what you do and how you work and uh, what's important to you. So I, I, can we get a little preview about how you're thinking you will use this, this platform for the next year as artist in residence? Some of it is in formation. <laughs> I'm very last minute about things. Um, but so next semester, um, one of the main projects I'm going to be working on, Carnegie Hall has a, um, a project that they're launching in April called um, The Making of America, Music and Migration, where they're, which is perfect, considering my interest. And they're basically uh, featuring um, like different kinds of, like, like Af the Great Migration, like African American migration from the South to the North, like, Eastern European Jewish migration. I forget what, what the last one is, but they're do, sort of doing it through um, incorporating musicians. And so I will be curating um, a program via the APA Institute for Carnegie Hall, which is scary, um, <laughs> but it's fine, I'll do it. Um, and I, <laughs> um, but I think that, um, yeah, I mean, I'm interested in just bringing, bringing into that um, conversation just like different kinds of like other kinds of migration. I feel like I want to bring in like more contemporary migration, like you know, Caribbean, African, Latino, South Asian, um, into that into that space, and just really, I'm going to be talking to a lot of folks in my community about like how to really craft that. Um, and a lot of my work is collaboration, so nothing gets done alone. And so I'm sure there's people in this audience that I will be talking to. <laughs> Watch out. And how are you thinking about sound? You mentioned learning electronic music production in addition to the, to the DJing. Before we've talked about what maybe field recordings, but I'm curious as to thoughts for how your sort of sound, sound art, beat making practice might develop. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm particularly interested in um, exploring sound culture and continuing to use um, or continue to learn and use like electronic music production as a way of like in, like integrating people's stories and so I'm going to be doing a, um, I want to be sort of just like interviewing like f you know different kinds of immigrants and like just doing different kinds of like story work and like archival work um, and you know web-based work and seeing how I can like pull those into like complex tracks. Um, I'm also working on a podcast 
um, with my best friend who's sitting in the front row. Um, I think I'm just thinking about like audio as just a as a storytelling tool. So certainly like like I mean certainly I feel like I I'm um, and love DJing, but also shifting a little bit into um, sound art. And the, and the wonderful thing about you know the term artist is that there is still so much freedom in it. You know, we talk about intersectionality a lot, um, but for for many, I mean, everyone's born plural, right? And it's a matter of sort of defending that plurality, uh, and it's it's to be in a space where you can do that and move in any different direction. It's really thrilling. Um, but I think one of the things that we were talking about in terms of prepping for the panel was that Tanu was like, you know, it's, it's a team effort. It's always about sort of extending, extending the space, extending the platform. Um, and so we have two more speakers who are about to join us um, and, and a brief film from them as well. So I'm going to read. It's in your handbook, but we will be joined by uh, Sonia um, Ginyanans, Ginyansaka. Ginyansaka. Um, oh. An internationally acclaimed poet, cultural organizer, and activist from Harlem by way of Ecuador, Guinan Saka has performed at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Brooklyn Museum, Galleria de la Raza, and has been featured at NBC, PBS, Latina Magazine, and many places. Um, they are a national leader in the migrant artistic and political communities, helping build some of the largest national undocumented organizations and participating in groundbreaking civil disobedience actions. And along with Sonia, we will have Jess X. Snow, who is a queer Asian American filmmaker, public artist, and Pushcart nominated poet. She uses magical realism and science fiction as tools to explore what care for the body and land can look like in the queer migrant future. Her film and VR work has been supported by the Tribeca Film Institute, Adobe, Smithsonian. Her public art and political graphics have appeared on PBS NewsHour, LA Times, UN Rights Conference. Amazing, amazing um, biographies. But what we have right now is a clip from a, a collaborative work between the two. And so this is called Nostalgia Borders. It's a two minute short film commissioned by the Brooklyn Museum this year for uh, um, Ginyan Saka's chapbook of the same title. But this is something that they worked on together. And this will be a sort of transition period in the mix that is this evening. So I think we'll, um, we'll roll, play it. Yeah, we can roll the film. Yeah, and then we'll have Sonia and Jess come on stage right after. Hi, Tanu. How's Hi, it everyone. going? Um, so we're going to transition to me moderating because I am a control freak. Um, but that was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, and one of the reasons why I wanted to show that um, or that we wanted to show that is because it was a collaborative piece between the two of you. So I wanted you to um, ask you what that collaboration was like, um, what um, that film meant to you, and um, what was it like to work together on something that's you know very personal. It was about your family. That's your family. Um, can you talk a little bit about the collaboration? Yeah. Um. Well, first of all, thank you, and everyone should be given a big round of applause because this is such a big deal, y'all. <laughs> Daniel, congratulations. Um, so not a sm small secret, but me and Jess have been friends for a long time. We were actually roommates, um, and I've known Jess we actually met at a reading, and after that, we realized that we had a lot of things that were in common, such as being migrants and trying to navigate this artistic world as like people of color, as queer folks. And so um, I think many times we're taught that this framework of competition, a framework of scarcity, a framework of like artists of color shouldn't be collaborating with each other. And so we wanted to create an ecosystem, and we did that by, first of all, living together, cooking meals together, having heart achy moments, and um, being siblings. And I think the opportunity presented itself when the Brooklyn Museum wanted to um, host a performance uh, where I'm reading from Nostalgia in Borders, my chapbook, and I wanted there to be a film aspect to it, and what better person than my chosen family, my co-creator, and so that's where the idea came. And we turned that around in like two weeks. Um, yeah, I don't know, Jess, if you wanna add a little bit more on that. Um, yeah, I think for me, like collaborating and working with Sonia is really important to me because I feel like 
we're under, we're, we're taught the Western capitalist notion that we have to only rely on ourselves, but I re really feel like, like self-love and self-care and existence is a collaboration and, and that we can become our fullest selves if we can ask for help amongst that, our chosen families. And, and I also think something that me and Sonia share is that like, um, sometimes we're not able to share, share everything with our blood, blood families and, and like, and, and in the places where like blood family fails, we can create like queer POC, like ch chosen family. Um, and we can together kind of imagine, imagine the future. So I think when we work together, there's like, there's like a kind of magic because there's like an intrinsic understanding of like what the other person needs. And for me, I, I just felt like I was just bearing witness to Sonia and Sonia's poetry and Sonia's family and just creating a space where, um, where they could remember like their homeland and time travel through a photograph um, back to their homeland and kind of create like a, a migrant future, so yeah. That's amazing. And um, the, the film is based on, is it based on this chapbook? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, so yeah, get this. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so one of, one of my interests, so first of all, I just wanna say that it was very intentional that it was this group of people on stage. Um, one of the things I'm particularly interested in is um, multiracial solidarity and um, just like collaboration, like multiracial collaborations. And so, um, you know, I, I, and, I, and I wanted to be in conversation with the three of you because um, we also do art in different mediums, right? It's poetry, visual art, um, and film. Um, you know, we're probably the most similar in terms of, um, you know, DJing and production. But I do think that there's um, something to be said about just like artists working together. And so the question I have um, for all of you is around like, um, your approach to um, multiracial and intersectional solidarity. And so, Jace, I wanted to start with you. Um, so, two projects in particular um, that interest me are um, your work on this, um, it was a, an Ableton plugin um, called Sufi Plugins, um, where um, it basically uh, used a lot of like, it was like Arab and North African um, music software and something that I um, saw online from your writing is that 90 to 95% of all music software is made in Germany, US, the US and Northern Europe. But Sufi Plugins was actually about creating, um, creating something for Global South musicians. Um, and then this other project of yours, the Julius Eastman Dinner Project, um, which is, uh, so Julius Eastman is um, a gay African American composer. Um, who passed away, um, and so you basically uh, brought his compositions back to life by using pianists, and you were manipulating the, mu the music, and you used Sufi plugins, actually, and you collaborated with a friend of ours, Aruj Aftab, who's a Pakistani Sufi um, immigrant. Um, these particular um, projects were interesting to me because um, of just the black and brown collaboration. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. It's funny, with, it's slightly different. With Sufi plugins, it started off as pleasure, like falling in love with Moroccan music when I was in high school. I mean, like, well, I'll never go there. Um, and then years later, I was living in Spain. I said, hey, I've been loving this music, listening to it, sampling it. But in a way, that's sort of, I mean, it's still, it's an engagement with it, but I could be, I could go further. I could sort of reduce this distance. And so, I started working with Moroccan musicians and that long process of, of what that's like. Um, and at, some, at the end of it, the sort of the other end, I said, you know, this software is so ill-suited to all the subtleties and the variations that are intrinsic to music from no, many parts of the world. Um, and so that led me on down to this project, which is both the sort of poetic homage, but then also it's about putting forward like a digital tool saying, yeah, like this is, um, it's written in this 2,000-year-old script called Neil Tifinar. It's very strange, but it has Arabic scales with a very specific tuning. You know, there's a plugin called Devotion that will lower your computer's volume five times a day out of respect for the Muslim call to prayer um, and their presets, you know. 
fervent, observant, agnostic, devout. Um, but, but that whole project, it was a way of being a sort of outsider, but then saying, I can move closer to this, to this music um, by both working very closely with musicians, um, and then I can take what I've gained from that and sort of pour it into another artistic response. Um, that's kind of back to my domain of that sort of software music technology. Um, and with the Eastman, it, in a way, it was a bit different. That was me, you know, eight or nine years ago, discovering Eastman's music for the first time and having my mind blown because he, you know, I'm, I'm very familiar with New York experimental music in the 70s and 80s, minimalism, disco, all these things, and I'd never heard of Julius Eastman, and I was like, ah, this is, this is a problem, <laughs> you know? And so my response wasn't, oh, I'm just going to sort of, um, and I'm sure you're seeing images of us performing it in a church, I think, and also the Sufi plugins. That's, yeah. Um, and they're all free. Um, but so with Eastman, I was like, okay, this is a history I feel a bit more, kind of more bound up in, um, but I also want to keep it alive and stir up the trouble to take this really, um, he was a friction, he, he, caused, he caused problems, he didn't solve them. And so I was like, how can I bring this together into a piece that will sort of extend all the rascally um, complications of Eastman and sort of give, give homage to his spirit? And so yes, I brought in Arouge, sort of amazing, um, really gifted vocalist, um, and had her turning corporate double speak into a song at the end, worked with all these pianists, and turned it into this big touring project. Um, but the thread with all these pieces is you have this sort of the seed of an idea or the question, and then slowly you're like, well, how can I put together the team, the machine, the organism that can best realize this? Um, and that sort of spreads out to what we're calling these various types of collaborations. It's acknowledging one's own limitations and saying, who, who do I need to make this more strong? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and Sonia, sort of same question, but um, some of the things that strike me about your poetry um, and you know, just like your being, your presence, like everything um, is just like the way in which you talk about your, um, your multitude of identities, you know, just as a migrant, um, as a queer person, um, you know, as a puppy femme, um, and um, you know, you've also like talked about like anti-blackness in migrant spaces. Um, you talk a lot about like sort of the intertwining of identities and like not um, not wanting to compromise because that's not a way to liberation. So, can you speak specifically to how your art helped bring together a more um, inter intentional intersectional politic for you? Yeah, definitely. Um, that is not an easy question. Sorry. And we got this um, over the past few days and I was trying to like really put it together. And I think it comes down to the fact that I'm tired of negotiating like how my body shows up in spaces. Um, and for me, coming from a movement space, I realized that in particular settings, I could only be immigrant in a specific way or be a, specifically a good immigrant um, show up in that way, queer in different spaces. Um, they couldn't intertwine in many, many times in the policies that we were working on. And I was exhausted by that. And when I was writing, when I was writing my poetry, when I was organizing writing workshops for and with other undocumented writers, I realized that that was a space that we can show up and be ourselves authentically, problematically, like all of our ways and grow from there. I think that many times we're not allowed to create, we're not allowed to imagine ourselves in all the possible ways. And so that's how, um, and becoming this like hybrid artist, um, not just as a poet or a person in literary spaces, but as somebody who's navigating art institutions, is also navigating movement spaces and cultural work and cultural equity spaces. Um, I'm realizing that we have to do our best ways to show up in all of our ways, um, yeah, and disrupting this like nonsense of like what is um, a legal body, what is like this like American body, what is um, given whose body is given the rights to exist in this country, in this world, um, and so I think that's like my approach and um, creating intentional intersectional spaces, um, not leaving any of my aspects behind, um, and that also comes with just recognizing that we're constantly growing, so um, yeah. Oh, thank you, that's perfect. Um, and Jess, um, you know, I mean, you talk about your own um, migrant trajectory, your family's from Beijing, China, um, but you also talk about your privilege as a migrant, 
Um, and you know, through your visual art, what I find so incredible about your art is the way in which it uplifts some um, people's right to migrate and it uplifts like undocumented stories. Um, and so my question to you is really around like why, why do you think the like inter-immigrant solidarity um, is important through the arts? Um, and also, um, you know, you, you uh, collaborated on a piece with Chip Thomas um, for Brick um, around like, so it was like a mural of Sonia Sanchez and Mahogany Brown. And can you speak a little bit to those like multiracial collaborations you've done as well? Okay. Um, yeah, so I think that um, inter-immigrant and multiracial collaborations is really important to me as, as an artist because the, um, like when I first moved to New York, the place where I found my artistic voice was in was within like community of of all these artists who didn't have feel like they had to compromise um, all the different parts of their identity the same way that Sonia was talking about. But I also recognize that I come from a place of privilege. Um, my mom and I um, immigrated to the. Um, like my my parents immigrated to um, Canada from from Ronanchan, um China, and then um, and then I was born in in Canada, and then my and I grew up in a domestic violence household. So my mom kind of like wanted to leave my dad, so she took me, and we came to the to the U.S. from Canada because that was where her, her nearest relatives are, and it took me about like. 10 or so years to for me and my mom to get her her green card and stuff and we and and she had just like different citizenship statuses and in, in the process and and I think that um something that I think of a lot about about like me um telling um me uplifting narratives about um black black women in murals or about um undocumented people um, from a place of, of privilege is is where the invitation comes from because I started um, uplifting undocumented stories because through through the work that Sonia was doing at had culture strike and they were inviting people from all these different kinds of intersecting um, migrant identities um, from of all these different backgrounds to to make work um, and there was a project called visions from the inside where where um, where all these migrant artists were um, were were supposed to turn turn these letters written from undocu undocumented mothers and detention centers into um, works of art that evoked kind of like 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 a, a positive um, that uplifted the love that the mothers the mothers like shared with their kids so I think um, um, when I'm when when I'm invited by by like Chip Thomas, who is a black black artist, to make a mural with Mahogany Brown, um, I feel comfortable like making work in that space. Um, but but I think that um, for me it became really important to figure out how to how to uplift um, the stories of of my own people as well and 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 for that to be in co collaboration with uh, uplifting um those those the stories of my chosen family and the people who have invited me as well so yeah i don't know if that answers your question yeah, it does yeah and i think just the reason why i asked that question is because i think about sort of you know inter intersectionality and like multiracial like collaborations a lot in like my own work i think that I think one of the slides at some point, it's like, um, you'll see like all of the flyers from Ibomba and like, it's, all, it's also, it's just chosen family. It's like, you know, the, the communities that we wanna, we wanna feature. And so, so much of my work is, because I don't really do like identity specific work. It's, it's more about, um, you know, it's like, how do, we, how do we create like artistic spaces that really uplift all of us? Which is why I asked that question. Um, so Sonia. <laughs> Um, so you and I have known each other for a really long time. We've known each other for about like eight years. It might be ten. I don't remember. Yes. Um, and uh, we met when I started working at the New York Immigration Coalition. You were at the New York State Youth Leadership Council. Um, and um, you know, 
we were working on like the DREAM Act, um, you were really involved in sort of um, just direct action, civil disobedience work, um, and eventually you shifted into doing more culture-based work. You work at Culture Strike now, um, and just like your own organizing separate from that, your own work as an artist. Um, can you tell me a little bit about why you made a shift to culture-based uh, strategy work, and perhaps maybe starting by defining what culture-based strategy means, um, and also why you decided to pursue um, your career as a poet in more full force. Yeah. So Culture Strategy 101. Um, go. Let's go. One minute on this. Uh, so the reason that I, that I started shifting away from doing community organizing or mobilizing undocumented migrant communities and young people around a specific policy was because it was not sustainable. I actually burnt out after do doing a, like, a bunch of actions, coordinating actions. I realized that a lot of the things that we were doing, we were operating from like trauma, we were operating from scarcity, and we were operating from places of just trying to figure out how to live. And we, there was a moment where I realized that the work that we were doing was very reactionary. It was not helping me define what kind of community I was trying to build. It was not defining the kind of world that I wanted to live in. Um, it was a community driven by a policy. And so this is around the same time where I started seeing a shift in a lot of organizers also moving away and going back to their craft. And, and so I, every time people ask me this question about cultural strategy and cultural work and why that shift, I, I usually start with the question I, I throw to the audience. How many of you identify as artists, cultural workers, writers, uh, filmmakers? Can you raise your hand if you're able to? How many of you are like fully doing that on the daily, like that's your full-time job? Can you, may you raise your hand again? Okay. All of our hands should go up. Um, and so, in our movement spaces and the way that we see the transformation um, that we want to see in the world, the policies that we want to change, the way we want to see this country uh, shift its ways it's treating people of color, migrant folks, black folks, like, it's just driven. Um, it's framed that the only way that you can approach that work is by doing policy, reactionary work, um, by doing things in, like, legislative. It does not leave room for us to imagine any world's possibles. Uh, we're leaving behind a whole like section, a spectrum of folks of us engaging with culture, like the food that we eat, the movies that we see, the books that we read, everything, the apps, the, the dating apps that we're engaging with, everything about that is, is an uncontested space that nobody's organizing in. And it's driven by white supremacy narratives, and so, the way that we're thinking about is that for there to be any political change, any political shifts, it first has to come in the cultural space. You have to change people's public sentiment. You need to change people's hearts and mind. And so that's why the shift happened where I, and that's not to say that cultural work is much better than political work or activism work. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that there has to be a multiple approaches. It cannot just be policy. It cannot just be reactionary. It cannot just be legislation. Um, so that's the shift in what we're trying to do in movement spaces. And as a cultural worker, as somebody who's like, cultural strategy, like center that in your work, um, it allows us to imagine like possible worlds. Um, I'm tired of being told of what I am what I am not. I'm tired of telling people what I am not. Um, I'm not illegal, I'm not this, I'm not that. Um, I wanna come from a place of like, this is what I am, and this is what my community looks like, and this is what we want, and this is what's gonna happen. Um, so coming from that place of possibility, um, I had to shift, and I think many of us should start doing that work and acknowledge the rich work that artists and cultural workers who are on the stage and within you, what they're doing, because um, at the end of the day, you don't go home and cuddle with like your policy, like packets. You don't. <laughs> you're on your headphones, you're turning your Netflix, um, or you're cut up with another artist or cultural worker, right? Mm -hmm. So just pushing that out there for you. Thank you. Yeah, and that's exactly that's exactly it. I think that you know, talking about like the world, like imagination, like expansive imagination of like the communities we want to create and see, and like for me, like 
in the spaces that I've like helped to form and like just the, the spaces I, I participate in. I think like that's the beauty of like what we can do from in the from the arts. And that's what I've been able to do through DJing is like create, even if it's for like two hours, like the possibility um, of like what what a community could look like or like what migration could look like through a DJ set. Um, Jess, I'm like such a fan of your art. I'm just like really fangirling. Um, so one of the things, um, so we showed the Nostalgia and Borders film, but you've worked on like lots of different kinds of films like After Earth and Motherland um, that connect up these issues of migration and the climate crisis. And a lot of your public um, art and murals, you know, I've noticed like visuals of birds and water, tidal waves, you know, science fiction. Um, one of the pieces that at some point we'll scroll um, is like a protest art that says queers want a world without borders, abolish ICE, which I love. Um, but so, so basically this quote of yours from a TEDx talk that you did really struck me. You said, borders and immigration law and detention centers are all part of the tools of a world where dreaming has been made illegal. Um, can you talk about why you engage with themes like migration and climate, as well as themes like sexual trauma, self-care and healing, and um, how they're connected and why you explore them through art? Um, that's a really good question. Thank you so much. I think that um, in the quote from the TEDx talk, when I say um, borders, I think um, um, by borders, I also mean not just like the physical borders dividing countries, but also the borders dividing like gender identities, the borders that divide like straight, straightness and queerness and, and, def and like define us in all of these other ways. And also the borders that divide like our bodies with, with the earth. And I think that that's important to, to state because in a, um, in a world where like we are like allowed to dream and heal like i imagine like these borders to like to like no longer um exist and for me um when i think about like cl climate change and migration um i also think about like queerness as well and i think s something that i'm really interested in is and exploring is how um because how like um, my family's migration is what has afforded me the ability to to be queer in public and and not have to um, be be as afraid as as I would be like if if we were still like in China and stuff and I think that's something that's really important to me and then when I think about like the art that I make about the the earth. Um, I think about like like my body as has a planet and the same kind of sexual trauma and and um that my body has survived and also the the trauma of migration and the the trauma of everything that happened to me um I, I think of my body as a planet and when we look at the way that the the earth heals from trauma um um I think the earth um like there's there's like wildflowers that only bloom after like forest fires and there's and in order for our um um bodies to heal um we have to kind of like we have to kind of like be open to the ways that the the earth heals and see grief as like has like a season and i think um that's been really important to me and uh, and I feel like, like I want to explore all of this in my art, um, because because I, I see my my art as creating kind of like the planet that the planet that I I wish that I could live in, and what and how like that planet can create a home for my queerness and for for um, all of my like immigrant chosen family and and everything else yeah no thank you um yeah just to say that um yeah i mean like i, I 
I've been working um, in the climate justice movement for a, a while, and like for me, it's really like art like this that has been the most inspiring, um, and really like it's folks of color who are doing work around climate justice that are the most inspiring, and it's been you know it's difficult at times to work in in the U.S. climate movement. It's very very white, um, and it's so like whoa. Um, we just. <laughs> We just like came, um, I, I'm like looking at my friend who I work with, um, the climate march was like a couple of weeks ago and just like the amount of labor that people of color have to do in spaces that are like mainly run by white, white folks. But um, all to say that like I think it's art like this in the way in which you talk about, like you articulate like climate, your body, queerness, like migration as like a collective thing. Like that's why I'm doing the work that I'm doing and I'm interested in it and I think that that's why like a cultural strategy actually makes it like more expansive. Um, and uh, Jace, I wanted to talk about your book. Um, if you are an NYU professor, put this on your syllabus, please. Yes. <laughs> also probably will help your publishers. Um, but just to say, like, I love I love this book. Um, I, you know, I remember when you were writing it and you were really stressed about it. Um, and, but it really came together. But in particular, um, I was um, really uh, fascinated with chapter six, which is, um, you call it cut and paste. And you really seamlessly go from talking about like MIA and like mashup music and collage and the ways in which like MIA is sort of like, you know, I think there was a quote about how like, um, she said something about, um, in one of her first interviews about like, who would have thought that a Sri Lankan refugee would have been um, influenced by Chuck D and sort of about her like influences from like Brazilian carioca funk to like Caribbean music and how she brought that into her, um, into her um, sort of work. Uh, but, but then you transition into talking about cumbia in this chapter, and that's actually what I want to talk about. Um, I, in, in sort of the articles that you've written, I've known you to write a lot about cumbia, norteño, border music, um, Trebal Monterrey. Um, and um, in, in this particular chapter, um, just for folks who don't know, cumbia son, sonidera is basically um, a type of music where um, it's a, you know, it's from different parts of Latin America, but this is Mexican cumbia in particular. And a, a sonidero is someone who basically does all of these shout outs over, um, over the, the track. Um, so um, you talk about in this chapter about how you um, sort of like about cumbia, but in particular this um, quote, you say, um, cumbia sonidera New Yorkina is a form of organization a migrant politic that recognize and recognizes and uplifts its constituency through sound. It's a massive rethink about what a party can do, turning what would otherwise have been a flash in the pan nightlife moment into a people to people network strung between borders. Um, can you talk a little bit about what drew you to Cumbia Sonidera? Um, and just like in general about like why it is that you sort of tackle, you know, issues of sort of like border music in your book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, I mean, it's funny with Cumbia Sonidera. At first, I was it was it was the music, literally living in Sunset Park and walking by and hearing it everywhere, and then starting to be like, well, what is this? I, I speak Spanish, and then the more I looked, I realized that there's this incredible culture of the shoutouts, um, and so then I'm like, wow, it's all this thing. Like this is music, but it's also a media system. It's also a way of communicating across borders. You know, the sort of the way in which a club is a spaceship and a time travel porter and all these things. Um, and it's quite literally encoded into all the recordings. Um, and it's still what's most popular in the cumbia shops in New York City. It's these re live recordings of concerts where people are constantly, you know, here's the shout out to my aunt in North Carolina, to my cousin back in Guadalajara, and so on, so forth. And so with, I mean, I'm always interested in music contexts, you know, and music does nothing if not move, but so I'm really looking for these flashpoints. Um, and so this was an amazing opportunity to talk about an incredibly vibrant scene here in New York City that has no mainstream press coverage at all. You know, it's not cool per se, um, but it's doing so much. And so the more I paid attention to it, the more I started going to events, talking to Sony Dedos, the more I was like, this is actually quite massive and topical and relevant. Um, so let's unpack that and, and expand that and think about it. Um, and it's all part of a, a sort of a, a wider step, which I think we're sort of talking about, which is not just sort of creating culture, or putting on the party, but then taking a step back to be like, let's talk also and, about what this, what this means. Like, what are we creating together? Um, and yeah. Yeah. 
And like, I mean, it's sort of interesting because like in those party spaces, um, the Sony there is actually evoking the person who is not present, right? And so it, it, that's what you mean about like how like even if it's like a space in Sunset Park, they're actually calling towards people who might be in like Guadalajara. Yeah, and that's what was so, it's so poetic, you know, and I was saying I'm like you could text your friend or WhatsApp or Facebook or something, but no, you go to the dance, you gather in the room with your immediate community um, and then you have via the power of music, um, you have your name shouted out on top of it and then you send them this impression of it and they must get that. It's like message plus vibration plus context. And so as you listen back to recordings, you're like, wow, this is quite literally a, like a social landscape being, um, being sort of celebrated in this way. And then if you listen underneath it, the music is wonderful as well. Um, all that sort of melancholic, bittersweetness that, that we love about Cumbia. Yeah, that's amazing because I think that sort of connects to like my interests around like music as a way of like engaging with the barriers of the nation state. Um, so I think as a final question, and then we're gonna actually go to Q&A, um, I wanted to talk about uh, abundance. <laughs> Abundance. Um, so <laughs> last night, actually, my best friend and I, when, when I was like spiraling out of control about this um, event and trying to figure out a way to sort of like connect everything together, we were talking about this concept of like, um, you know, there's no me without us, there's no you without a we. Um, and, um, you know, like oftentimes in these art spaces, um, there's a lot of competition, right? We're competing for the same spaces, the same grants, like recognition from institutions. Um, but I guess like in spite of all of that, like one of the big themes that we've been talking about tonight is collaboration and about imagination. So I guess my question to all of you um, is how do you work from a place of abundance and not scarcity? And I looked at you so you can go first. <laughs> <clears throat> constantly being in communication with other artists and cultural workers of color throughout the country, like talking to undocumented artists, talking to migrant folks who are at the border in El Paso, working on murals and all of these different things. And you know, it's just so badass. And I think that coming from that place and knowing that what they're doing is not in competition to what I'm doing. Rather, we're working collectively. We're working from, yes, we're working collectively. We're creating an, um, again, my key word is like ecosystem, right? Like what you're doing and what we're doing together um, is for a greater good, however we wanna define that. But we are here collectively working for something. And so if I have the means and the resources, however we wanna define resources, yo, we're gonna help each other out. Um, I think we've learned from um, many movement spaces that the fighting and the competition and the not getting along um, is a form of like disruption of like the amazing work and the resilient work, the way that we can exist, like can happen. And so I'm like always grounded in the fact of like the people that I come across and all the artists of color, specifically queer and trans, gender not conforming artists of color who are just like hustling right now to create and reminded me that, you know, we have to continue fighting for cultural equity and continue to create spaces and shift resources to them, open up whether um, there's art institutions who are like, yes, I'll give you an internship, but they're not paying you. Like, we don't wanna, like, fuck that shit. Like, we wanna be in your boards. We wanna be making decisions. We wanna negotiate what we wanna archive about our people, about our community, and what are the things that we wanna cu uh, curate and create. And so, I think for me, it's just like centering on the fact um, of the artists that I'm among. And there's always this framework that artists work in isolation. We actually don't. Like, if you know artists who are, Artivists, um, you know, we're always in collaboration. We're always in community. We're always thinking about our community. And so, if we start from that framework, um, I think there's abundance. And and yes, sometimes it's very scary. And sometimes we're taught, and we're all going for the same grants. Um, but that was made for us to fight. And so, I'm also thinking about creating our own like. Um, place of resources that we can tap into so that we're not going after like the crumbs that they're trying to give us. Um, so, yeah. Chase? Yeah. Yes, I mean, basically, 
what, what Sonia said. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, I think that in talk, terms of not being reactionary, it's, it's quite difficult because the world, you know, like the world wants the atomized neoliberal individual um, to shop alone at night in front of their computer. And so like pushing back and being aware that that's so present, um, it's, it's part of what, realizing these things. But, but specifically, I think like abundance, you know, art and the economics of it all, like it's difficult to be a DJ, it's difficult to be a working artist. Um, and so for me, it's, it's very much about um, just kind of being explicit about kind of like how I got wherever I am and where I intend to go and the various people, musicians, et cetera, that helped me get here, you know, and part of it's writing a book and part of it's putting up detailed track lists for sets of mine that are online. There are many different stages, um, but it all comes back to um, not allowing one's uh, privilege to be naturalized, you know, and so much of the art world wants it, again, that, that economy thrives on the, the brilliant, gifted individual working alone. And it's not like that at all. Um, but that's a myth which is deeply entrenched. Um, and so even conversations like this are a way of sort of cracking that open. It's like we're, it's so, it's, we're in this moment of insane interconnectivity. It's us connected to major corporations via Instagram. It's us connected to each other, sweating in the club. It's very strange right now. Um, but uh, yeah, being verbal about the challenges and the excitements or how I go about things. So I think when I think about uh, abundance, I, uh, um, like so something that I've, I've learned is that it's not this new like radical thing. It's like a thing that a lot of um, Asian people, um, or, or, or like in, in, in terms of if I look into the East and look at my own ancestors, like the idea of abundance that we are, we are an infinite well of wisdom and we already have everything that we'll ever need um, to like tell all the stories and make all the art that we'll have. That's something that my ancestors have known for a long time, but I have forgotten because I've grown up in and like capitalistic westernized America and I, and I feel like a lot of the the like the like culture of the scarcity mentality is also based on the idea of like colonization like we have to go into into cultures that we are not from and tell like other people's stories and like we have to continuously like discover new things and and like take and rather than than like know that there that like all we need to do is kind of look inside ourselves and like like and like honor our own stories honor the stories of our own communities and we already have like enough sto stories to tell for like the rest of our lives and i think that um something that i learned i guess through like love and relationships is that if you're if you're always looking for happiness from an, an, another person or an external place, it's always going to run out. But until you can kind of clean the mirror to see your own reflection and see this infinite well of love inside of you and in you, your own history, that's when um, that's when like the love is never going to run out. And that's when how we can create from a place of abundance. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I just want to say that for me, when when uh, we were conceiving of what this event would look like, um, I was very clear that like in order for me to do this event, I needed to bring other other people on stage because like for me, like that's what collaboration is, like that's what abundance is, that's what I do in like all of my work, like that's what my community does in like other nightlife spaces that they throw, and so I really wanted, I really want to like emphasize these themes of like imagination and collaboration and abundance in like a lot of the work that I'm gonna do here at. Um, the APA Institute. So thank you so much for being here with me. Yes. So we have two, two last questions sure. before we move to the reception um, moment. And the first is for you, Tanu. Um, and the question runs, as an artist, cultural producer, and activist, a lot of your work seems to involve gatherings, people gatherings, people congregating in the streets or coming together in clubs, in ways that don't always resemble community, but more transient forms. So can you talk about the importance of moving bodies, dance, marching, and the intimacies and antagonisms involved? Oh my god. Great question. 
<laughs> um, uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah, so I don't. I think basically what that question is like um, is sort of gleaning out is that there's not necessarily an assumption of community, right? In like all this, these spaces that we're creating, like whether it's like going into like a nightlife space or whether it's like a march, it's people who don't know each other. Sometimes it's people who don't care about each other, who don't want to connect. And like where, how is it that you can sort of pull some value and meaning out of it? And I think that it's complicated. I think that on the, you know, at its worst to talk about, you know, like nightlife spaces, like it, it's spaces where people don't don't connect, and I think it's spaces where like it's very cliquey, or it's about like you know it, it's not about actually like building across platforms, and like that that's totally possible, you know. And, and I think like in other sorts of like more activist spaces, like it's constantly b bodies in motion. Um, at its best, I think it's like bodies in motion that are actually trying to uplift each other. Um, so, for example, even when I think about like. Um, the Muslim ban protests at JFK, it was like actually physically people were asked to go to JFK to put their bodies on the line for people who were not being let out of JFK. And I thought that that was like a real, like it was people who didn't know each other, but it was like a sense of like, we're coming from a place of like love, like we must love one another or die. Um, and so, um, yeah, and you know, and 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 I think the thing about nightlife spaces, I think for me as like a DJ, um, in like public spaces where I'm manipulating the music, for me it's about like creating meaning or attempting to create meaning for people. So when even when people are having like their own moments, so for example, you were talking about like the security guards like dancing in the corner. I've definitely had moments where it was like, you know, um, the bartenders or like the servers at an event. Like it's like I think that that's like the role of like a culture worker is like to you know take people who are like bodies in motion like people who don't know each other and and create meaning so those like beautiful moments where like two people who don't know each other like start dancing or you know two people in some sort of like a rally or protest type situation where they see the cops and they like make sure that each other like gets out of that situation like that i think is like the best possibility of, you know, bodies, bodies in motion. And the last question is for the for the panel, which is, uh, what are your upcoming projects? What's next? So I'm working on a augmented reality Miro and VR project called Survivor Love Letter, and it's a collaboration with my one of my really good friends, um, Tani. Haikeda, and it's basically, um, we're trying to create these monumental murals of queer and trans um, POC survivors of sexual assault in New York City and Los Angeles, and then, and then you can go up to each mural and then um, with your phone, and then it will turn into a love letter that the survivor wrote to their younger self. And then you can scroll through an entire library of love letters written by survivors all over the world. And then there's going to be like a VR meditation where these sur survivor love letters are going to turn into meditations. And and um, and, and I and I guess I'm interested in seeing how art can be standalone art, but it can also be a be a tool to to heal mental health, and it can also be a tool to build communities amongst queer people of color. Okay, um, as a full-time worker, uh, my current work is really organizing artists and cultural workers of color across the country, um, and so that's where like majority of my time is going, advocating for cultural equity, advocating for resources like in the funders, uh, with other grassroots and movement organizations, and like helping them understand how to engage with artists and cultural workers um, in the work and the projects that they're doing. Um, and also with our institutions and understanding how to bring more folks in that look like us. Um, and not just on a one time like moment of like internship or fellowship, but rather like fundamental like shifting like their infrastructure. Um, and then the work that I'm doing on, a, on my own projects, I'm 
working on a manuscript and um, a bunch of different performances and collaborations and also hibernating. I feel like many times as artists and cultural workers we're told to create constantly um, and creating also means that we go back a little bit and we take a break and we rest and we love and we eat and and go to Thanos like parties and dance. So <laughs> that is what I'm doing in the next couple of months. Um, well, speaking of dancing, um, I have two upcoming gigs. Um, Ibomba is taking over the Rubin Museum of Art on October 5th. <laughs> it's free. All ages come through. <laughs> and um, I'm also going to be DJing uh, Papi Juice on October 20th with a whole roster of people. My friend Mo is here, who's one of the amazing people who runs Papi Juice. If you don't know about that party, you should. Um, and uh, just really, you know, using this opportunity of the APA Institute to really um, be thinking about um, moving forward some of this work I want to be doing on sound art, working on a podcast, um, working a full-time job, <laughs> attempting to sleep. I have cats, like I, I cuddle with my cats. That's my self-care. Yeah. What about you, Jace? Okay, well, um, on Thursday, I'm giving a talk in Montreal as part of Pop Montreal, and on Friday, I'm DJing there as well. Um, but the big thing that's sort of over my head and driving me crazy um, is I'm having there, an exhibition of mine will open at Harvard Art Museums this fall um, called, called The Great Salt. It involves three bass kalimbas, modular synthesizers, transatlantic sermons, from the 17th century engraved in aluminum, all this stuff. So it's, I'm deep in it right now, um, but it'll be exciting once it finally enters into the world. Let's hang out all the time, because <laughs> I'm just trying to learn from you here. Um, yeah, so I think um, we're going to close, but I wanted to, um, so there's drinks, hang out. We're actually turning this into more of a party vibe, and I just wanted to introduce the DJ who's going to be performing tonight, Aisha Chug. Um, is called, uh, she's from DC. She's a, an amazing DJ, and she's recently just moved to New York, and I wanted to sort of feature her, um, an, another amazing South Asian DJ who's just like, um, yeah. Um, so we, we just wanted to like open the space up into sort of like the, a celebration space as well. Um, thank you so much to our panel. <laughs> Sonia, Jess. Jace, and of course Danu, and as a small token of our gratitude and welcome, we have some flowers. Oh, and so now, welcome to our reception. Mm -hmm.